Hello everybody, welcome to another one of these things. I hope you're all well. I'm certainly doing well. It's a little chilly, <laughs> uh, but I'm braving the weather for all of you. So today I'm in Toronto's Riverdale slash Leslieville. Uh, in my opinion, Leslieville is a little bit further east from here and officially the city calls this Riverside. So I'll call it Riverside. <laughs> that building behind me is called Baseball Place, pretty new condo. The reason they call it Baseball Place is because on a property just south of that building, was Toronto's first baseball stadium, Sunlight Park, and it was also home to our first professional baseball team, the Torontos. Uh, the first ball was thrown in 1886. They moved the team to Hanlon's Point Stadium, uh, which isn't too far from here. And famously, Babe Ruth um, hit his first home run at Hanlon's Park Stadium, and that ball landed in Toronto Harbor. Uh, and it's said to be the most valuable baseball in the world, but good luck finding it. <laughs> it's somewhere at the bottom of Toronto Harbor. Well, anyway, today I'll be shooting with Sony's A6700. Let's see how this goes. I'm reinventing myself. I'm me and nobody else. Ooh, I can't help but smile. Riverside starts at the Riverside Bridge. Opened in 1911, made with Scottish and English steel. Traveling east on Queen Street, Leslieville starts at Booth Avenue. A lot of Canadians will know this, but popular performer Drake used to be an actor on a television show Degrassi, named after this street. Is that real? The whole time he pretended to be my friend. There's a lot of great mural art and mural artists in Toronto, so all the credit for these following images goes to them. This one, um is outside a cookie shop, so I guess she's got a sweet tooth. I really like this guy here. And for this last one, I couldn't agree more. If you want to see a bare knuckle fight over a can of WD-40, fishmongers Chris Tapson's famous for their smoked salmon, to explain a smoking fish, the awesome storefront of Queen Books, Considering the $234,000 US based price of the Urus, it's a very popular SUV in Toronto. It was probably bought at Grand Touring Automobiles, you can see it in the background there. The shot taken from Riverside Bridge. Car people will know Doug DeMiro, he comes here to check out special Bugattis like the $19 million Bugatti La Voiture Noire. This is a Beachman e-bike designed and assembled in Toronto and the rider is actually co-founder Ben Taylor who used to work at my favorite Toronto brewery, Steam Whistle. He built this bike for them. Ben, build me a bike too. A different kind of e-bike here. Between Riverside and Leslieville, I'd say there's about half a dozen breweries. The Brickwork Cider House makes a cider called the 501. The 501 is the streetcar that runs up and down Queen Street. I'm sure it was AI that helped me lock onto this pedestrian across the street through two panes of glass. Looks like she's deep in thought while crossing the street. Sleep standing or listening to music, I'm not sure which one, but I was sleeping on my autofocus settings. My guess is that it's a cake. The Good Neighbor comes highly recommended for gift shopping. The colors on the bench are the official Leslieville colors. Those colors once again. Some coordinated storefront colors. Greta Solomon is a restaurant. My girlfriend Mar's brother Ali loves Descendant Detroit style pizza. Now if that's Detroit style pizza, is this Boston style discounts? It just turns out that it was a backdrop for this movie set. They still call Toronto Hollywood North and lately they've been shooting a series based on the Cruel Intentions movie. Uh, a lot of the studios are in the center of the city. The pylon guy is always a dead giveaway that they're setting up for a shoot. Nirvana, Foo Fighters, Metallica, Eminem, they've all played at the Opera House. I stood in the freezing rain across the street for about half an hour trying to make this shot happen. Very heavily stylized edit. 
Tango Palace Coffee Company. Another very stylized edit. I brought my sister and her husband here for a coffee when they are visiting from Los Angeles. For coffee and a croissant, I recommend Bonjour Brioche. Or if you're just a fan of the show, Handmaid's Tale. Are you serious, dude? This is your first day or something? What's your name? I'm opening a restaurant next door called Incompleto. No, I'm not. It was freezing out, so this guy gets his trooper certification for sure. This guy skates across the city every day, so he's definitely a trooper. Mm, I don't know. Does that cover smokers? I'm no expert. These two were smoking just before I took the shot. I do like that jacket or coat. Oh, there's a jacket. Teach their own, I guess. A slightly more subdued style. It was so dark, I can't believe Autofocus nailed this. I do get a lot of transit vehicles in my shots. I was surprised at how interested he was in what she might have bought at Sephora. This is the Broadview Hotel. A building with a colorful past and some nice architecture. Some more nice architecture, some modern architecture taken from the bridge. These cutouts above the diner, revealing some mind-bending perspective. Around here they call them Victorian cottages and they do add charm to the side streets. Stephen Carras, fashion designer, now owns this 1911 Bank of Montreal building. I really brought up the levels in this one. Surprisingly clean image. Breaking all the rules with a strong vertical through the center, kind of like Rothko. I was so happy I didn't miss this shot. It kind of encapsulates everything the neighborhood's about. We got the tragedy of businesses that have closed and the hope of a new generation. Hey there again, here we are in the studio, thankfully, because it's freezing out there. I've spent the last five afternoons, five evenings shooting all the photos that I want for this episode and uh, I've got a chest cold. You don't want to be out there with a chest cold. That's throwing caution to the wind. And you know how else I'm throwing caution to the wind? I'm shooting this without diffusion on my lens. <laughs> uh, I'm normally shooting my talking head with some diffusion. Those of you who've been on the channel before know that my talking head sometimes look a little bit like a soap opera. Well, uh, I thought I would give it a go without any diffusion. I, I put the diffusion on there to hide the laugh lines, you know, because I laugh a lot. <laughs> uh, anyway, uh, I'm... So, those of you who have been here uh, before to the channel know that I don't really do reviews. I do sort of pseudo reviews, like my real world take on given products and, well, first few weeks into owning the A6700, I did a video about it and I figured after two months I should probably do another um, video, I was going to say review, another video about the A6700 is sort of a review. Uh, but I should probably go over some of the reasons I bought the camera in the first place and then maybe some of my other comments might make a little bit more sense, I suppose. Uh, so I shoot these episodes with the FX30 and FX30 owners out there who bought the A6700, one of the primary reasons that uh, people do that is so they can match the color between the two because if you didn't know, the FX30 and A6700 share the same sensor. So there you go. One of the reasons I bought this camera as my second camera, it does share the same sensor, so that's kind of handy. Another thing is I like to travel with my stuff, and I knew when I bought the FX30 it was sort of going to be my work camera, and then I really realized that once I got it that, uh, yeah, I don't want to travel with it. I'm accustomed to traveling with cameras like uh, my last travel camera, which was the A7C, amazing uh, travel camera, roughly around the same weight as, uh, as this guy here. That is another reason why I bought this as a travel camera. I will be shooting with this professionally, I have already. Um, I, the one card slot doesn't affect me whatsoever in that regard. I, I do take some precautions uh, uh, regarding the, the one slot. Uh, but I do use this as a work camera as well, but my real work camera is the FX30 and this is um, So one of the reasons I bought this was for travel and also for shooting things like I did that little intro segment I'm not going to be carrying the FX30 out doing those kind of things either. I'm going to be 
shooting video, the same camera I'm shooting my photographs with. Another thing, um, I needed to trigger a flash. I do flash photography every once in a while. You can't trigger a flash with the hot shoe on the FX30. The FX30's hot shoe is relegated uh, to audio devices. It's an audio interface. This is also an audio interface, but it will also trigger a flash. Another reason I got this, uh, for various reasons, I need a mechanical shutter as well. I need a bulb mode uh, because I do um, long exposure stuff, um, so uh, uh, light painting, things like that. Something I missed uh, more than I thought I would um, because I am a hybrid shooter and I'm accustomed to having an EVF or at least something to put my eye into like I did back in the film days. <laughs> uh, the EVF. Uh, this has been great. I'm going to go into the pros first in a bit, then I'm going to go with the cons. Uh, but having the EVF is a pro, obviously. Um, a bit of a con that it isn't the best EVF, although I've got no issues with this at all. The combination of the EVF uh, and the screen, although the, the screen as well, you can't hold a candle really to the screen on the FX30, uh, but the two together, uh, not so bad. So I'm going to start with the pros first, but before I go into those, I just wanted to go into the pros of sort of being in this ecosystem. Now I started with regular film and then I went to APS-C film. Yes, it was a film format before it was a, a digital thing. Uh, and then from APS-C film, I went to an actual APS-C camera. It was the NEX5. I was doing some work for Sony. Uh, I was sort of semi-affiliated, semi-affiliated with Sony uh, indirectly. Uh, I am not at all anymore, haven't been for years, but through designing some displays, in-store displays for the original NEX5, I managed to score an NEX5 and I was sold on the camera anyway because I read a lot of the spec sheets while I was doing the advertising or the in-store displays for the camera and I was sort of sold just reading the, uh, the promo material on the camera and then once I got my hands on it uh, I really saw the benefits of shooting mirrorless and aps -E. And I, I own a lot of the A6000 series cameras. And then, uh, like a lot of people, I bought the A7 III, and then I had the, um, uh, the uh, A7C as well, the, the original. Uh, anyway, back to APS-C, starting with the FX30 and now the A6700. Benefits of being in this ecosystem, lens availability. I can share these, I can share lenses between the two cameras. Um, there are so many lenses available on this system. Uh, APS-C lenses, full frame lenses if you want to shoot full frame lenses with your APS-C camera. So lens availability is insane and um, the reason I took you through this whole journey of my camera history is uh, really because of this lens. The combination I was using when I was out on the street, the 75mm f1.2 with the uh, A6700. Uh, this lens, I've done a couple videos about this lens before, uh, for those of you who don't know, and uh, some of my misgivings, one was the weight and the other was autofocus, both of those a little bit unfounded, like, okay, weight, it's a, it's a big glass in this, in this lens being a f1.2 as well as it being metal construction. Benefits to a large aperture benefits to metal construction. Uh, if you want those two things, you're gonna have a you know a heavier lens, so no big deal. Um, I had the 56 mil f 1.4. That was my portrait lens before. I love that lens because I could travel with it. It is lightweight. It's probably still the best travel-friendly portrait lens you can get on the APS-C system. I, uh, I I know it's the best travel-friendly uh, portrait lens for the APS-C. Uh, system. It's a 56 and it's a 1.4, so in my world, a 75 and a 1.2 uh, <laughs> beats a 56 and a 1.4. Uh, but that's just, you know, the way I shoot. And again, um, I'm not traveling with my portrait lens. For me, my portrait lens is also my street lens. I'm the kind of street photographer I don't like really getting into people's faces. I love going out and talking to people when I'm shooting. That's one of the, the things I love the most about street photography is out there meeting people uh, because you know I'm like stuck in my little cave here you know uh, but um, but I don't like being in people's faces and it's really nice um, 
having uh, a longer focal length. And also, like, yeah, if you don't want to disturb somebody, if you're trying to get something that's a little bit more candid and not posed, uh, because, you know, once you start talking to people, you know, then you're having people pose and things like that. Um, so, anyway, the weight, not an issue, because I'm not traveling with this lens. Autofocus, it was a little unfounded too. Uh, uh, normally, I'm shooting this thing wide open at f1.2. There's not a lot that's going to be in focus. That's what you pay for. You pay for a lot being out of focus when you're shooting at f1.2, uh, you know. Not like, not deluxe, like 0.95 uh, out of, you know, everything out of focus. Uh, but it is a little bit difficult for an autofocus system to lock on sometimes when you're shooting that wide open. And that goes for, I guess, pretty much any autofocus system, right? So... I can't really get on it uh, on it too much for autofocus and I shouldn't have in the past necessarily because I don't really have another f1.2 to compare it to. Another portrait lens I used to shoot with was Sony's 85mm f1.8. When I had an a6300 I used to shoot with that as my street and portrait lens. Um, that was a little bit too far in APS-C and so the 75 fits the bill perfectly. This lens has made me just that much more in love with this camera, really. Okay, the advantages of APS-C and being in an ecosystem with a ton of lenses available, that's definitely a benefit. Now, what about the actual pros of this camera? I'm gonna start with this mode dial. Now, I don't even know if I touched on this at all in the original video. I may have touched on it, but I probably didn't talk about it a lot. I'm gonna talk about it right now. I absolutely, oh, this is just, it's just so nice having this. The, the convenience is awesome, being able to quickly switch between photo and video. And then you've got your, uh, the, the programs available here on each. Genius, I know other camera manufacturers have done this uh, before Sony, uh, but for us Sony people, it's, it's awesome. And, and I guess that started with the uh, a7 IV. That's actually one of the reasons I was seriously looking at the a7 IV because of that the mode dial there um you know when you're you're out and about traveling any hybrid sort of environment like that um you don't want to futz around too much being able to quickly switch between those two two things it's awesome so something else and i know not a lot of people have really brought this up one of the people who has brought this up is gerald undone now he's a bit of a nitpicker and i am in some respects too and this is something that i wish sony had done way back because the fx30 hasn't got it but now we've got it with the a6700 and that is a card that pops out like this so from the back you can actually see the label on it how has it taken sony so long I and mean, this has been mentioned over the years and now finally Sony has done this, so it's kind of nice to see that. And uh, Gerald Undone did bring that up, that he's glad to, uh, to see that in the A6700. Yeah, too bad our other cameras haven't got that yet. I'm sure going forward Sony will uh, turn the uh, card slots around in all their future cameras. <laughs> Fingers crossed. You never know about Sony. For a stickler like me, it's a nice to have, but it's not necessarily a pro of this camera. So, okay, so we've started with the mode dial. That's definitely a pro. The next thing is the fact that we've got this dial in the front. And not just this dial in the front, but the placement of their other customizable buttons too, especially someone coming from the FX30, because you can pretty much match what you've got on the FX30 to this camera. At least the main stuff, like exposure triangle stuff, uh, is the most important, right? Your aperture, shutter speed, and ISO. Provided those are in the same place on both cameras, you're kind of good to go between the two cameras. So I, I've set those to be the same in the same place. Muscle memory can be a good thing. It speeds things up. Sometimes it can be a detriment though to things because if uh, your muscle memory is telling you to do something like, oh, I'm with my FX30, oh, oh, oops, uh, it's not in the same place on my A6700. That could be a problem. Another great benefit I mentioned in the voiceover, AI subject detection. The AI chip in this thing is, is is bonkers. I don't want to use uh, game changing because the autofocus has always been great in these cameras, but there are definitely some shots that I was able to nail out there that I would not have been able to do 
uh, if I hadn't had that AI thing going on in this and it's fantastic. I hate using stuff like Game Changer and Next Level and stuff, but it, it certainly is uh, Next Level. I'm not gonna go Game Changer on that, Next Level. So, oh, uh, by the way, another note between these two cameras, I mean, whether you've got like a FX30 or, or the A6700 or any camera where you can register faces, uh, do it, especially if you're a YouTuber like me. If you're doing this talking head stuff, if you're sitting up here doing something uh, simple or even a little bit more complicated, it's pretty incredible um, how quickly it'll pick out your face if you've got your face uh, registered. Anyway, <laughs> just so do that, all right? Ergonomics, this grip, I, I really like it. I, I did a video about this case, by the way. It does make the grip a little bit longer and a little bit more uh, beefy. I, I really loved this grip before this case, so the grip is definitely one of the benefits of this. There are probably some pros that I'm missing, uh, some of the cons. Okay, on the EVF and the screen, I can't say I've had any difficulty whatsoever uh, operating this camera, usability, anything. I have really no complaints of, about this EVF. The screen, it's not my FX30 screen, but my FX30 screen's gotta be an awesome screen because it hasn't got an EVF. I've got both here. Uh, so what about a con that actually affects me? Wireless communication. This is something that isn't gonna affect everybody, but certainly for someone like me, it does. Right now, I'm controlling my camera the FX30 with Sony's monitor and control app. I know for a fact that the hardware that allows for wireless communication in the FX30 is far superior than the hardware in the A6700. I know this because Sony is required, just like any company making anything with wireless capability, any device that they're manufacturing with wireless capability, it's required that they register those devices to be in compliance with the governing, you know, um, authorities, what have you. Andrea Pizzini, some of you may know him, he's the, the rumors guy, he's, he does camera rumors and lens rumors. He's got his sources, he's got his people who let him know there's a new camera coming. He knows that for sure when Sony registers their cameras because their cameras all have wireless capability and and so they have to register these cameras and he knows when they've got the powerful wireless hardware in them or the sort of consumer grade uh, wireless hardware in them so this camera does have wireless capability but if you compare it to the fx30 well you you can't compare the two uh, when I'm using the monitoring control app with the FX30, often there's like no latency whatsoever. I do end up dropping uh, the connection every once in a while, so it's not great. Uh, but uh, Sony's monitoring control with cameras like the FX30, much better than the Creators Studio app for controlling the A6700 which drops out all the time and the latency is horrible. It's barely usable. You cannot use the A6700 with the monitor control app. That is relegated to just Sony's professional cameras. One of the cons, obviously, one card slot. Hasn't been an issue for me. Uh, I've talked about you know how many card failures I've had in, 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 a, in my lifetime and uh, that would be where I've lost data, that would be zero. Uh, I have had card problems, not in camera. I had a card problem because there was a problem with the card reader. I was transferring some files. I think it was a bad cable or something like that. It did corrupt the card, although everything on the card was 100% recoverable anyway. When I'm shooting with this, I'm backing up like midway through shoots and everything like that. If you're not using the same ratty card for years and years, you don't want to do that. You want to change out your cards. Things are getting a little rough looking. I've heard Mark Bennett talk about his cards actually falling apart. And now he only shoots with the Sony Tough cards. I actually talked to him in person about this too. <laughs> and uh, I was kind of poking fun at him. Uh, but I understand where he's coming from. Like, I mean, these kind of things happen. And I think in also cameras that get really hot, I'm going to bring up uh, that overheating thing too. Uh, cameras that get hot, I believe that the actual plastic of the uh, of your SD card can actually lose its oils as well and become more brittle in a camera that's that's getting hot. 
because if you pull out your card in a camera that's been overheating, that card's really, really warm. <laughs> and, and I can't imagine that uh, that does anything for the life. Any, it, it's certainly no benefit to the life of your card. Okay, overheating. When I got this camera, I had the 1.01 .01 firmware installed on here already, I believe. Now, there has recently been the 1.02 firmware that's come out and it has listed as stability being one of the improvements on there. Now, I think overheating would probably fall within the category of stability. I'm not really sure, but I haven't seen any videos, surprisingly, uh, that have done a comparison between the 1.01 .01 firmware and the 1.02 firmware. As far as overheating goes, um, uh, there are videos about how to update your firmware. There are videos about the the 1.0 firmware versus the 1.01 .01 firmware as far as overheating. So I plan to do a video that compares the 1.01 .01 firmware to 1.02 firmware and seeing if there's any benefit whatsoever as far as overheating goes. On the topic of overheating, have I ever had this camera overheat? The answer is no, but then again with my use case, if I'm doing long form content, I'm going to use the camera that's got the fan in it, the active cooling, the FX30 has got that amazing fan. I've now been running this camera for hours, like basically all day, uh, and, and we're into the evening now, we're at like, wow, uh, quarter to six, and I've been running the camera all day. Uh, does it overheat? Certainly not. Uh, this guy here, I would never put this camera through that necessarily, but no doubt that just shooting at 24 FPS at normal temperatures, like ambient temperatures, I don't think we would get this camera to overheat very easily. And from the tests I've seen, people are going through their batteries and what have you. Uh, but if you're shooting at the higher frame rates and you've got your camera out in the sun, no doubt that this camera is going to overheat if you're shooting at 60 fps 120 i wouldn't be shooting at those frame rates for any length of time so i know of videographers event videographers like weddings and stuff like that and they'll shoot everything at 60 fps the reason they do that is so they've got the flexibility to go back in later when they're editing to slow down what they want or extend clips if they need a little bit more and so they sometimes they like shooting everything at 60 fps i would never do that like it's not really it's not the way i work if i if i want something slow i i'll know it while i'm shooting and i'll just switch into 60 fps or even uh, 120. we know all that stuff about uh, full frame versus APS-C. has it been an issue for me shooting APS-C, not having a full frame sensor no absolutely not this is incredible what you can get out of this and its low light capabilities are awesome uh, for any camera, uh, APS-C or full frame, for any camera, the low light capabilities of this camera are awesome for video and photo. Are they going to be as good as some other Sony cameras that are full frame? <laughs> no. <laughs> but. But uh, for most people, are, uh, they're not going to have an issue with the uh, low light capabilities of this camera. So am I going to rack my brains coming up with more stuff I don't like about this camera that I actually love? Um, no, I mean, that's pretty much it. Like my overall experiences with this camera have been amazing. Has it been what I've wanted so far? You know, like, yes, uh, I can match things up to my FX30 lighter and smaller than my FX30. Can use all the same lenses that I'm already using with my FX30. Uh, the AI autofocus, um, the customizability. So it would only be responsible for me to mention the fact that I've had some viewers reach out to me saying that they've been having some issues with their older Sigma lenses and their flashes like been freezing their camera they've had to restart the camera to get the camera going again. Now that's, you can't really work with a camera like that. It's I've spoke to Sigma reps recently and they've told me that they haven't heard from anyone complaining about such a thing. <laughs> so at least here in Canada, uh, Sigma hasn't been hearing from anybody who's had any of these issues. So if you are one of these people who's been having issues with your older Sigma lens or your flash or, or whatever, you know, make sure that you communicate that to Sigma, communicate this stuff to Sony.
Now, Sony did mention in that latest firmware release in the list of things that it's supposed to address, uh, one of the things was stability improvement. And that would certainly fall under stability improvement, not having your camera uh, freeze on you. <laughs> so, um, so anybody who is having any of those issues, um, try the firmware update, then get back to us. I know I don't have a ton of followers. It might not make the biggest uh, difference in the community. I imagine that the uh, firmware update from Sony can only improve things, uh, and hopefully that is the case. Anyway, I hope you guys all got something out of this one. As usual, if so, consider leaving me a thumbs up. If not, that's okay too. If you want to make sure you don't miss any of these in the future, please think about subscribing. And until next time, keep working and make your chosen idea a reality. Peace.